<laughs> Hello. Hi, it's Colleen from the library. Thanks for joining us tonight. I hope um, it's pretty much all our friends. I get that. Um, <laughs> so don't forget that next week we've got a couple things coming up. John's writing group is on Monday. If you're interested in that, or you can register for that. And we have um, next Tuesday is In the Belly of the Beast, Martin Luther King in Chicago um, with Clarence Goodman. He's come to the library a number of times. He's a fantastic speaker. I hope you can register for that. It should be very interesting. So tonight we have Rita's Quilt. It's the story of a <clears throat> badass cross-stitcher who found <laughs> a pattern at a uh, yard sale or a estate sale. And now that quilt right very at this very moment is hanging in the National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Kentucky. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our speaker, Sharon, Shannon Downey. Hello, everyone. I can't see you, but I believe you're there. And I'm excited that you're here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I am, you should look at fun pictures instead of mm, just me rambling on. Um, how's that? Can everybody see that? Oh, I have no idea how to tell if you can see that, but I'm yes, going to go with see it. that. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> Audio, awesome. <laughs> um, cool, so my name is Shannon Downey. Um, most people know me as Badass Cross Stitch on the internet. Um, and I love to go estate sale shopping. And you know, normally I'm estate sale shopping looking for antique textiles that have been hand embroidered. Um, and then I buy them up and I stitch, you know, modern feminist political messages on them. Um, and I have about, I don't know, like three years ago when I, when I learned what an estate sale was and I started going to estate sales. Um, the first one I went to, I was like, oh, this is so weird. Like this person clearly just died. And now we're like in their house going through their stuff. And I was super creeped out by it at first. And then I got in there. And I have a degree in archaeology and I was like, wait, this is fascinating. Like their entire life is in situ. I can go through, I'm like making up all these stories about these people and like trying to, you know, learn about what I think they did and, you know, learn about them. Um, and the first one that I went to, there was like a crafting room and there was this like, you know, comfy chair and a little table next to it. And it looked like somebody had just like gotten up and walked away from, from their perfect seat. Um, because there was a, an unfinished uh, cross stitch on the little table next to the chair. I was like, well, there's no way I can leave that there. Like, that's, that's so sad. That person passed away in the middle of making this project and I can't, there's no way they're resting in craft peace. Like I have to, I have to buy that. I have to finish it for them. So I took it home and I finished it for them. I mean, we're talking like 20 minutes, right? Like small project, just like finishing off. I think it was home sweet home. Um, so I finished stitching it the way that the original artist would have stitched it. And then I like framed it and dropped it off at Goodwill thinking like this will make somebody happy. Um, and I've like done my part to make sure that this person can move on because there's no way they're not if there's an unfinished project there. So I, this became a thing. I started like, you know, the more estate sale shopping I did, the more that I would find these little projects and I would just finish them off for people. Um, and, you know, I didn't really talk about it. I just sort of did it and that was it. Um, but there was this one day and we were, I was out of state sale shopping and it was one of those days where you're like, okay, just one more on the way home because we're just gonna, you know, like we can't just pass it by while we're driving home. And so it was in Mount Prospect and um, we sort of pulled up and, and headed up to the door and uh, there was a for sale sign outside. So I knew that the person had probably passed away walked in and my friends went in ahead of me and they're my they're my estate sale shopping friends and by the time i got up to the door they'd already walked in were standing and pointing at the wall and they were pointing at this um whoop, hold on advanced slide hold on okay i got this look technology um they were pointing at this this like absolutely beautiful hand stitched map of the US and all the flowers of each state around the outside and it was framed and it was, you know, poster size on the wall. And I saw them and I was like, oh my God, what perfect. And I took it off the wall and I started looking at it and, you know, 
as I'm studying it, I'm like, wow, this woman was an amazing stitcher. Like, like, look at that. Like, look at those French knots. Look at that stem stitch. Like, I just, I love French knots. She clearly loved French knots. And, you know, I was immediately in love. And, and the price tag was $5. And while that was like super exciting for me, who was definitely going to buy it, it really was indicative of like how sad I feel when, you know, women's art in particular women's handicraft is like, um, you know, sort of discarded or not valued. Um, like this piece probably took her 25 hours and it's, it's gorgeous. It's like a beautiful work of art. Um, and then it was just sort of on sale for five bucks. Um, so I immediately said to the woman who's running the estate sale, like I'm buying this. Like, I'm going to leave this right here and then go look around because there's no way there's not other stitching stuff here. And she was like, oh, if you like this, you should go in the bedroom. There's a box of supplies. And so I'm always looking for supplies. So I went into the bedroom. There was a bin on the floor and there was nothing else in the room, which was so weird. Um, so I sort of sat down and opened the bin and I was thinking that I was just going to find these supplies. And I found this, you know, anti-coupe and I'm like, they don't make them like that anymore. So I was super excited. And then I started parsing through it. But then I found this pattern down the right hand bottom corner there. And, um, and then I started looking at the pattern and I started looking at all the pieces and I realized like, man, this is not, these are not supplies. This is a project. And this is like a completely prepared, but not executed on um, like embroidery slash quilting project. And my friends were around me and they just sort of hung their heads and they were like, oh man, like this is not the usual project that you finish. I'm like, I know, but like, look at it and her stitching. I already fell in love with her. And so I thought, well, maybe they'll charge me too much. So I like took the whole bin to the front and I was like, how much for this? And they're like, well, do you want the Tupperware too? I'm like, yes, I want the Tupperware too. They're like $6. And I was like, God, I'm totally buying this. So $11 later, I left with the bin full of supplies and the map. And, you know, as I was leaving, I sort of jotted down the, um, the address of the house that I was at, which I don't normally do, but there was something about, like, I need to know this woman um, just because of, you know, how much I connected with her artistry. Um, but then I got home and I started to go through it. And I was like, what am I thinking? Like, there's no way that I can do this. It's one going to take the rest of my life to just do the embroidery part. And two, like, I don't quilt. Like, why am I, like, why do I think that I can make this giant, what turned out to be like an absolutely giant quilt? It's like a queen size quilt. Um, so I thought, well, I bet, you know, I have a like really lovely Instagram community and it's pretty sizable. And I thought like, I bet some of those folks would help me if I asked them. So I, I brought the story and some of the images to Instagram and I was like, Hey, does anybody want to help me finish this? Like, or take a piece of it or, you know, can I send you a couple embroidery hexagons and, and you can fill them out and then, you know, I'll figure out how to turn this thing into a quilt. And within, 24 hours I had over a thousand volunteers and like not just like oh I guess I'll do it but like people who were like enthusiastically yelling at me that I better pick them and that they better be able to stitch something and so it became this like crazy hectic scene of me like scrolling back and scrolling back because it's all happening on Instagram and I'm trying to be fair and so I'm like going back to the beginning and I'm, I'm making a list of names and spread, like I'm building spreadsheets and, and I'm, but I do no vetting of these people. I just like, I'm like, well, if you're this excited about it, then, you know, I'm sure you know how to stitch. Um, and so sort of like made my list and then I reviewed the pattern and here's sort of a um, close up of the pattern. And I realized that in addition to the 50 states, um, the hexagons of 50 states, there are also 50 stars. And those were supposed to be um, applique. But I thought, well, if I make them embroidery, then I can involve 50 more people into this project. And because I have so many people who are excited about this, like I mine as well. So I decided all of the stars would be um, embroidered as well so that I could involve uh, more folks into, um, into the project. So as I was 
getting everything prepared to ship out to, you know, the hundred people who had, um, who I had, you know, selected to sort of work on this. Um, as I went, like actually went through the bin again, um, I realized that Rita, uh, the original artist had actually completed both um, Alaska and Georgia, which like for me was really, really important because prior to this, I had no sense of how this person wanted um, the quilt to look or how they would have created the quilt. And for me, it's really important. Like if I'm finishing somebody's work, I'm not changing it. I am just I'm just the hands and I'm finishing it according to the, like their artistic vision. And prior to finding these two pieces sort of in the mix, um, I had no idea how she would have stitched it. And then I found these and, um, and then I was able to offer sort of some guidance and directions for the artists. Um, and I try not to limit them, but I, I did want it to like have a consistent look and to, you know, to look the way that I think that the original artist would have wanted it um, as, as closely as we could get it. And so this gave me an opportunity to sort of like create some directions for folks around colors and, um, you know, different stitches that she had used and, and techniques, um, which was really exciting to me. Um, and so then I had to prepare uh, 98 envelopes to go out with all of the pieces. So it was the, you know, the original um, uh, hexagon that she had transferred um, almost all of the patterns over. There were a few that needed to be transferred over. I would send them the original, um, the original pattern and the hexagon uh, just to make sure that, you know, because sometimes when you iron the transfer pattern on, and uh, it's not exactly clear. Um, and then I included, you know, um, a list of instructions and just sort of um, the colors and, and different things that I would like them to consider. And I gave everybody one month to get their pieces back to me, which is like not a ton of time, especially for the state hexagons because they involved, you know, birds and just a lot of stuff. Um, but I do know anytime I do a project that's a public project, like you have to keep momentum in order to make sure that the project doesn't die off. And so I really saw that as my role as like the momentum keeper and sort of the project manager of, of this quilt. Um, I didn't realize how aggressive a timeline I made because I do not quilt. Um, but you know, people went along with it. So that was good. Um, and then I went to the post office with all of them and I like had them all prepared and it's like, here, so like run these through the machine. And, you know, the man laughed at me and was like, here are 300 stamps, have fun. <laughs> so my like quick trip to the post office was three hours later as I just stuck three different stamps on each one. And ooh, that was not my favorite day because post office. After that, folks had a month and like, I started to see all of these pieces getting worked on and everybody was sharing them on Instagram. Um, and it was so exciting to see everybody working on them across the whole country. So there, there were folks from across the country. Um, I tried to stick to the US, three Canadians snuck in, so I let them in. And, um, and then, you know, everybody's working on them. And so what I did was I built um, a Facebook group for all of us just so that folks um, would have an easier way to communicate with each other. And I saw this as a new community of people who are creating something together. And so I wanted everybody to be able to, um, to feel that community. And it was, uh, it was amazing because folks were putting so much effort into their pieces and like a lot of pressure on themselves. And as more people started to learn about the project, like they felt, you know, even more pressure. Um, and so there were like tutorials and people were like sharing different stitch techniques. And it was just like a pretty intense month of everybody working on these. And it was, um, it was really beautiful to watch people's commitment to it. Um, and through that process, I realized like, oh, I haven't shared this on Twitter yet. And like, I love Twitter. So I should like tell this story on Twitter as far as it is at that point. And so I put together a little thread. Um, and that's when things really went bananas and it really went viral. And then suddenly like every press outlet on the planet was reaching out to me. Um, it was also like late November coming into December. And so everybody's looking for like a really nice 
nice holiday story and it you know the quilt is one of the biennial quilts so it's this real like americana quilt and so you know there's a lot of analogies around like stitching the country back together and and other such nonsense um and what was interesting was like while we were stitching we were actually talking about like oh it feels really weird to be stitching an americana quilt right now and to be stitching borders when we're like you know talking about borders and you know so we're having all of these sort of like geopolitical conversations around this quilt and the press is like reinforcing this whole like um narrative around yeah these nice ladies are like stitching this dead woman's quilt and like it's fixing our world um but i actually came to really appreciate that uh later because i realized that it was actually bringing people to this project and to this community and and to this conversation that like probably would not have engaged in the conversation prior to this quilt and then we were actually able to have some really interesting dialogue around it um as a result of of the just the way that the press had handled it and the way we were feeling about it um so it was really quite beautiful um and then when you know when the twitter attention started um we got reached out to by both brewer sewing company and um fabricana fabrics in in canada and they were like we want to give you whatever you need to like finish this quilt which was really neat so they you know they sent us hundreds of dollars of materials so that we could um we could finish the quilt meanwhile um i told you i had sort of like written down the uh, the address of the home where I, I bought it from. And I knew there had to be librarians in the group because um, I love librarians and we hang out a lot. <laughs> and, and I figured that a bunch of them were like in this crew. And so I was like, hey, who's a librarian? Who wants to do some research? And so immediately like 10 people were like, just send us the address and step away. And I was like, yes. Um, and they started doing all this research on um, who who was the original artist. And, and so we learned that her name was Rita Smith, that she was 99 when she passed, that um, she was a mom to two boys and she was a crafter and like, you know, just sort of a depression era um, mom who did everything. And she would be in stitch groups. And we learned a lot of this from her sons who, um, who we talked to, one's local and one's sort of in New York. Um, and and they you know sort of reinforced like she was a feminist she would have loved this although she might have been embarrassed that all this fuss was happening around a project she didn't finish um which i totally understand but for me it was really important um to know this about her because when i when i started this it it was just to finish a project to honor someone i didn't know um and then when it got started to get all the press attention and um, I started to get really anxious about like how her family would be experiencing this um, because I knew she had just passed in August. This was only in September, October, November. Um, and I didn't, I was just really uncomfortable with the idea of like her family seeing this in the press and then being like, what? This crazy woman like went to my mom's estate sale and now all of this stuff. Um, but when I talked to them, they were super supportive of it and and really were just like excited about what we were doing. So um, so that felt like a huge relief. Um, and then strangers started showing up to my house because I needed them to show up to my house and help me because I had no way that I was going to be able to do this myself. So just folks from the Internet, which I would never, ever do in my life. But quilters, you know, they're magical. So um, people came in shifts over like two weeks and they would be at my house for hours, like washing um, all of the pieces that had come back from the stitchers. Uh, and then we were, you know, drying them and then uh, I was blocking them and then we were cutting them and, you know, just all of the work that you have to do to prep something so massive. Um, here we are drying them. They took over my, my weaving room and then I blocked all of them, which I like wasn't going to do um, because I knew it would be like, you know, hundreds of hours. But by that point we were like, I had seen just how much effort and energy everybody had put into their pieces. And I wanted to make sure that every inch of this was perfect. So we started blocking them, which is like, you know, you, First you dry them and then you like pin them really tight all around um, and then you wet them 
and then you pin that, you know, you sort of pull and pin until they're stretched really well. And then they, they dry that way. Um, so it keeps the integrity of the embroidery and it doesn't sort of like shrivel up. Um, so that's what's happening here. And then um, when I had asked folks for volunteers, there were a lot of people who were like, yo, I don't want to embroider, but I'm a quilter. And the minute you need me, you call me. And then this one woman was like, if you need a long arm quilter, I'm your, I'm your person. And so I was like, oh, cool. Let me Google what is long arm quilting. And I did. And I was like, oh, we need you. And so I reached out to Sarah and I was like, hey, Sarah Evans, um, I'm super into this long arm thing, <laughs> this giant machine that's going to quilt this thing, um, you know, at a much faster pace than anyone could ever by hand. Um, and she actually came in and sort of became the lead quilter on this project. And um, this is her diagram and she started like mapping everything out and then, you know, like organizing it so that when we had our um, quilting day, like it would run flawlessly. And I'll, I'll talk about the quilting day in just a minute. Um, but in the meantime, it was a little bit like a movie, you guys, like, I, uh, so the whole quilt pattern, right? Like it comes with a giant sort of generic map of the US in the middle for this quilt. And one day I realized like, oh, I didn't save myself anything to stitch. Like I gave it all the way, that's super sad. And then I remembered the giant map in the middle. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to stitch this giant generic map. Um, and so I pulled it out of, of the box and I held it up and as I held it up, because it's transparent, through it on the wall was the map that I bought of, of Rita's map. And I, I held it up and I was sort of like, what? And I walked it over to the wall and I realized like it was almost exactly the same dimensions. And so in that moment, I was like, well, whatever, Rita's quilt has to be centered. Like Rita's map has to be centered in this quilt. Like her work should be the centerpiece and, and this is clearly meant to be. Um, and so this was the day that I like, you know, uh, held my breath and, and took it out of the frame to see if it would be usable. Um, and it, it totally was. And so then, um, you know, it became the centerpiece of our, um, of our entire quilt. And so Sarah rolled up with this giant wall and we started sticking things on and labeling things and organizing things to get ready for um, the sewing party. And she, um, she prepared all of the additional pieces for the quilt. And like, you can see what an organized, amazing human being this is, because if I had done it, it would not have looked like that. And then 30 plus quilters, hand sewers got together in Chicago at Wishcraft Workshop. Um, and we were hell bent on um, hand piecing the entire top of the quilt in one day together. Um, and that's what we had sort of been preparing for. And this is on December 7th. So, so that's like, what, uh, September, October, November, three months um, from the date that I found uh, all the stuff at the estate sale. And so we were there, we were all set up, um, like every press outlet on the planet came. Um, this is the Kelly Clarkson team. This is BEZ, this is the BBC. Um, Atlas Obscura, ABC, NBC, I mean, literally everybody was there, um, and it, which was just really funny because um, all of these women were like, get out of my way, you're slowing me down, I don't want to talk to you, we have quilting to do, and, and that day I learned like nobody flexes harder than quilters, um, and I love them for it, and so um, we worked in quadrants, and so each team had a quadrant, and we stitched um, each quadrant together and then started like merging tables and merging quadrants as we went through. Um, Heather over here on the left, Heather Kinian, who was another key power player um, from the, the quilt community who stepped in and was at my house, um, you know, as much as Sarah, she took on the, um, the map and making sure that um, the map was framed out to the exact size that it needed to be to fit into the quilt. So that was her her task for that day. And then it was um, eight hours later, this is 8 p.m. Uh, when we put in the last stitch. So this was like the last group that had, had lasted that long, um, putting in the last stitches. This is be easy. I just have to shout out be easy because they hung 
all day. It was really impressive because I was ready to go to, to go home and like pick it up again tomorrow. These ladies were not having it. They were going to finish. Um, and at the end of eight hours at 8 p.m., they had hand pieced uh, the entire top of the quilt. Um, and so that was a, a really magical moment and magical day. Um, I mentioned the Kelly Clarkson show had been there filming um, and they, you know, had asked me to fly out to LA to do a spot on the show and like reveal the quilt. Um, but obviously the quilt wasn't done. And so, and they asked me to come like on a Wednesday and then on like Sunday night they called and they were like, can you come tomorrow? And I was like, no, I cannot. I have to teach the last class of the semester on Wednesday. I cannot come. And they were like, we really need the quilt here. We need to like figure out how to make it look done and hang it and whatever else. And so I called Sarah and I was like, hey, Sarah, what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> she was like, I don't, I book fair. <laughs> I was like, cool. Um, do you want to fly to LA uh, with the quilt and boss around the Kelly Clarkson's production team until it looks good? She was like, I definitely do. Hold on while I go buy clothes and get on a plane. And like, I'm so grateful for her for that. So she flew to LA. She bossed around the Kelly Clarkson production team until that quilt looked amazing. And then I flew in the night before um, and we sort of like popped in and um, what was extra cool was anybody who was around LA that worked on the quilt drove in so that they could be uh, in the audience and we could all meet each other. So these are other stitchers who had done different states. Um, and it was really neat to like be able to meet them and in that context was really cool. Um, so then I went on the Kelly Clarkson show and it was super weird and I sat next to Blake Sheldon and Jamila Jamil and Kelly Clarkson and I don't really know what happened because I blacked out because it was so weird. Um, except that I had really heavy fake eyelashes on and I will never do that again. But look at how amazing that quilt looks because of Sarah. So it looks done and they flew it in from the ceiling y'all. Like it had the most dramatic reveal of any quilt maybe ever because they flew that thing in from the ceiling to show it off to the audience and to, and to talk about it. And it was, it was just really neat. Um, and then like 10 minutes after this, this photo, like we all descended upon it and like packed it up, put it in a suitcase and flew back to Chicago because we had one week to quilt it. Because like I said, I like to keep a snappy pace. <laughs> and I had scheduled a Chicago show of the quilt because everybody wanted to see it and it's from the Chicago area and I wanted to make sure Chicago saw it before anybody else. Um, so I worked with Woman Made Gallery, uh, who I'm a huge fan of and former board member. And I was just sort of like, look, can we like, can we have the gallery for a couple hours right before Christmas, you know, after your last show comes down so that we can at least display the quilt for a couple hours in Chicago. And they were so gracious and said, like, of course, let's do this. So poor Sarah hit her basement, hit her long arm machine. This is her very beautiful long arm machine. And she worked tirelessly for a week with all of her guild sort of like coming in and offering advice and supporting her and helping her um, in order to get that, that quilt done. Um, and then the night before the show, another squad of quilters showed up at Evanston Stitchwork and we, they, I'm not gonna say we, y'all, you'll understand why in a minute. They um, hand bound the whole quilt over the course of that night, like, you know, five hours of, of hand binding. I mean, they were just amazing. And they just kept going and going. And I did not because I don't understand the capacity to work that hard for that many hours. And I fell asleep in the corner um, and they will never let me live that down. But the next morning at 9 a.m., the quilt was at Woman Made Gallery and I was installing it um, for a two hour pop-up show that like I hoped some people would show up to. Um, and then, you know, we had a couple hundred people come through for the show and um, like people were driving in from other states being like, oh my God, I've been following this on the internet. Like, I love this so much. I had to come see it. Um, and, and it was like, I don't know, it was just the most special day ever. Um, and just to see like 
you know, folks reacting to it and studying it and seeing everyone's beautiful stitching. And, um, and then three hours later, we took it down. <laughs> and I love this picture so much. It feels like a Sistine Chapel picture. I feel like it should be like a Renaissance painting. And then immediately I put it into a, a UPS box and shipped it to the National Quilt Museum, which was astounding because a couple weeks or month, yeah, a couple weeks before we were done, they reached out to me and they were like, look, we want to display this quilt. And I was like, well, that sounds amazing. I don't quilt, so I'm not super familiar with the National Quilt Museum, or I wasn't then, I am now. And uh, so I went into the Facebook group and I was like, y'all, like, this is our quilt. Like, how do you feel about this going to the National Quilt Museum for a while? And then all the quilters like lost their minds and they were like, oh my God, it's the Smithsonian of quilt museums. And I was like, okay, so that's a yes. <laughs> and so uh, shipped it off to the quilt museum and they started working on an exhibit around it. Um, and we had an opening date uh, in early March, thank goodness. It was literally the, the opening turned out to be the week before the pandemic, like for real hit and everything, um, you know, went on shutdown. Um, but what we were able to do was like 40 of us uh, who worked on the quilt all converged in Paducah with various family, but everybody brought family. Um, so there ended up being like, you know, over a hundred of us in Paducah um, to be there for the opening. And this was at um, O'Hare. And it was funny because there's a really like there's one flight to Paducah every day and it leaves Chicago. So most of us ended up sort of like flying into Chicago and or I was already here and, you know, going to Paducah, but we didn't know each other. So it, it was one of those moments where like people would walk by and be like, Shannon, are you are you badass cross stitch? And I'd be like, oh my God, Ohio or Colorado, you did it. Um, and so then we quickly became friends. Um, and, and these are my parents who also flew in for it, which was just super sweet from Boston. Um, and then we got to Paducah and we started hanging out and somehow a conversation about like, we needed to commemorate this moment happened. And so the morning before the grand opening of the exhibit, we ended up at a tattoo parlor um, that we had opened at 10 a.m. just for us. And we had two different tattoo designs that represented Rita's quilt. And the majority of us all got permanent tattoos of our experience as quilters do, turns out. So here we are showing off our sweet ink. Um, and then we immediately went to the opening at the National Quilt Museum. And it was our first time seeing the exhibit that they had built. And they did such a gorgeous, like beautiful job um, of creating an exhibit that really encompassed the project and Rita and just sort of like everything that, that this project was about. Um, and we had like the press was there and we had like a for real opening where we, you know, different stitchers uh, got to talk about what the project meant to them. Um, and then, you know, the sign is sort of like all of the people that contributed to the project. Um, and, and they took, I mailed them a bunch of ephemera from, from Rita's um, house and, you know, stuff that I had bought so that they could create this like lovely exhibit. It was just really special. So these are all the stitchers who flew in for it and worked on it um, together. And now we are like all inseparable forever. And um, it's, yeah, it's really powerful. And then this is all of our families taking photos of us while we stood there in front of the quilt. And I had to take a picture of it because it was so funny to me how many people were just taking photos of us who love us. That's my dad. Um, he made a star. I taught him how to embroider back in, like in October, um, because he was having a, a triple bypass and he was sort of trapped in the hospital in Boston. And I was like, well, dad, you know, it's a great way to pass the time when you can't do anything active, like, let me teach you how to stitch. So it, it did. Um, and then I asked him if he would, he would make a star um, once he got good enough. And and he was thrilled and he did and he taught himself how to make French knots so that he could honor Rita's French knots. So he was very proud of himself. And so I have to show that photo because just it's adorable how proud he was of his French knots. 
Um, so that's the full exhibit there. Um, my dad had a picture of me taking it in, um, but I wanted to be able to show the full exhibit without a million people in it. Um, and then we took over Paducah, for real took over Paducah. Like Paducah's never seen this many people <laughs> and except for during the quilt show, let's be, let's be clear. Um, but, but we really partied it up in Paducah. Um, this sort of side story uh, is related to, you know, I am 60% optimist, 40% realist. And when I started shipping out all of the pieces, I was like, ah, what if something doesn't come back? What if something gets lost in the mail? Like I need to have a backup plan um, because I can't slow this thing down. So that day I went home and I went on eBay and I found um, the full like kit and pattern um, on eBay for like $3. And so I bought it real quick. Um, and so then I had like a backup in the event that like something didn't come through. And um, I was waiting until the very last minute for both Wisconsin and New Mexico. And New Mexico was just like lost in the mail and we didn't think that we were gonna get it, which was super devastating for the person who had created it. So I started stitching a backup New Mexico just in case. And then um, Rima here like was stitching Wisconsin, but she was also dealing with all of these like immigration issues around like her grandfather had passed and they couldn't, they were trying to get a visa to get her dad home. And so like, there's just all this stuff going on in her life, but she was like, it's super important to me, especially right now that I like finished this piece. And so Rima literally like drove to Chicago finished the piece while here in a coffee shop down the street from my office and then showed up to my office like five minutes before the end of the day, before the day that we were piecing it. And so in the meantime, I had my friend stitch a backup Wisconsin just in case. And so now I had like Wisconsin and New Mexico and a couple extra stars like just in case. Um, but then the day of New Mexico arrived in the mail and it had been all over this whole country. And then Rima's piece um, of Wisconsin arrived, so we didn't need the backup pieces, but I felt like they were such an important part of the story. Um, so I talked to Sarah about it and I was like, I don't, I don't want to leave any bit of this out. In particular, like people, you know, my friend who asked to stitch Wisconsin, like had never embroidered before. She She'd only cross stitched. She made this beautiful piece and she was so proud of it. And I was like, I can't leave that out. Like that's an important part of the story. So we made a mini quilt um, with all the sort of four backup pieces. Um, and, and this piece is really neat because it's something that we can then like pass around and people can touch it. Uh, Cause obviously we don't want them touching Rita's quilt. Um, so we have this really nice backup um, sort of like mini quilt that's another component to the story um, but then can like you know we've built in this sort of like interactive element to it. Um, I think my favorite piece or my favorite part about this whole project is the thousands of like messages and photos that I got from folks who were so moved by the story that they really started rethinking the art objects in their life and you know in particular the sort of like handicraft projects that their like maternal family and elders had sort of created for them um, and then people started sending me pictures of like oh my god my grandmother literally made that quilt with her quilt guild here they are like working on it um, which was just such a, like a neat thing and then like these these folks who knew me from Instagram were like, you will not believe this. Like we were staying in an Airbnb and look at the quilt that was on the bed. <laughs> and we're just like mind blown um, that this, you know, quilt from the 70s was um, it was so, so many places. Um, but it really was like people who um, you know, we're telling stories about quilts their family had made or blankets or stitchings and just like recontextualizing that and like Rita's quilt really added a lot of um, their perceived value of those things, which is like exactly why I do this because I want people like understanding how much artisanship goes into these things and how much effort and like 
the only reason why we dismiss this as something less than art is because women have been making it and it has been like you know um a, a way to keep women busy throughout history um but you know it's women documenting history and women storytelling and women creating art and crafting um you know for legacy and so i really wanted like that is what i wanted people to get out of this and that is what i saw people taking away from that um which was really special and then in addition to that just the idea that like social media can be used for good like we can we can do amazing things you know if we think about social media as a tool for community building and activating um around you know things that matter um and and this idea that you can build community anywhere right like we are sort of spread out all over the country but i've i've never felt so close to so many people as i do the the folks who worked on rita's quilt because um it was just such a powerful experience for all of us um so that that's sort of what happened um and then what's next is well the the quilt is going to stay at the museum through september it was supposed to come down in in may but because nobody saw it because the museum closed down um the week after we we did the opening and left um you know they were like can we have it a little longer and i was like yeah you know we all talked about it um so they're going to keep it through their quilt show in September, which is exciting. So people will actually have a chance to uh, to see the full exhibit, um, and then they'll send it back to me, um, and I'm I'm gonna take it on tour with me. So, you know, unrelated to Rita's quilt, I had planned um, that I was gonna go on this tour of the U.S. in my RV, um, and I was gonna bring my art and activism and this community building and all of these sort of like embroidery stitch ups and and craftivism work. Uh, to all the places that I wanted to go, but I couldn't because I had a full-time job and a part-time job and I was, you know, doing all these other things. And so I thought, well, let me just focus on this thing that is clearly my life's passion and, and my life's work. Um, and, but then Rita's Quilt happened and I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like I can bring Rita's Quilt to all of the people that worked on it and they can show it off to their community and they can be sort of the, um, you know, the centerpiece of, of their community and start engaging their community around craftivism and making and um, rethinking, you know, the value of, of these mediums in their world. Um, and so that's what I'm doing. And I leave in one week from today, um, which is why there's like cables hanging and there's nothing on the walls because I have nothing in my entire apartment right now. I sold everything I own. Um, I give up my car in a couple days and then I move into the RV and I, I head east to start. Um, but, but this is the map of um, all the folks who worked on, on Rita's quilt um, that I will be attempting to, um, to come across and, and bring the quilt to um, while, I'm, while I'm out on tour. And so, you know, it just, it's sort of the thing that just keeps on giving. Um, so that, that's the story. Um, if in fact you're like, I need to see close-ups of all of these things and I need to meet all of these artists, you can go to my website um, to the Rita's Quilt page um, and there is like, like full documentation of everything. Um, there's a link to the Kelly Clarkson segment so you can watch that. And then um, some of my favorite uh, news stories around it that I think did a really good job of um, telling the story. And then each um, each hexagon is represented with a link to each artist um, and then all the folks who worked on it uh, in the different capacities between quilting and um, uh, what, binding, that's the word, hello. Um, and just sort of like all the additional pieces um, are all there so that you can, you can really get to know everybody um, and, and learn about their contributions. And I imagine maybe you have some questions and I would love to answer them. Before we go to the questions, I have a one question poll. It is not a quiz. It's just a one question poll. If you wouldn't <laughs> mind answering this, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> answer the poll, y'all. <laughs> it shouldn't take long. There's not that many of you. <laughs> <laughs> Should I answer the poll? No, I can't. <laughs> you can't answer the poll. It doesn't let me. 
That's it. We've got our four. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> Hysterical. <laughs> um, I have a comment. I hope it. I hope that's all right with everyone. So one of the participants is my friend Judy Snyder, the one of the people um, watching this right now. And Judy and I went down to Paducah a couple of years ago because we're both big time quilters. Yes. We went down to Paducah and toured the museum because they were doing a uh, an exhibit on Japanese artists and we had been to Japan a couple of years ago to see the Japanese art show, quilt show. So it's pretty fabulous. So I'm yeah. just saying, if you ever get a chance to go to Paducah, it's a lot closer than Japan. <laughs> that is a fact. <laughs> and it is literally, you can get there and back in a day. It's, it's yeah. all worth going to. So Yeah, well, it was a shocking place. I had never heard of Paducah before. Um, and it was, it was kind of darling, like that downtown and like, if you like retail shops and vintage and, and estate sales, like I just spent like three days buying every antique embroidery that I saw. And, and so I came home with a full suitcase of them from Paducah because it was just like, it's such a darling little town. Yeah, it sure is. Judy and I went to Hancock's of Paducah. I don't know if you got a chance to go in there. Oh, of course I went to Hancock's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we literally spent half a day in there. I mean, how can you not? How it is not? This, like massive, like every fabric you could ever imagine in the entire world. It's like the most overwhelming place I've ever been. <laughs> I had like, you know, decision fatigue. I was, you know, at one point I was just looked at my dad and I was like, I, I have to go. Just like, here, here's the things I want. I can't be in here anymore. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So anybody have any comments, questions, anything you'd like to say? This is your chance. Ask me now. <laughs> if not, I would love to thank Shannon for coming to my coming to my library, as it were, <laughs> virtually. I really appreciate it. Um, good luck on your travels. Keep us posted. Yeah. Uh, like we'll have to uh, we will have to friend you on Facebook. The library will have to friend you on Facebook and keep up with what's going on in your life. Thank you so Perfect. much, Shannon. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks, y'all. A lot if of fun. If questions pop up, you know how to find me. I'm on the internet. I'm Very good. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, y'all. Good night, everyone. <laughs>